Okay. Now we've got a new slot. It's called "You Had to Be There," where we're asking journalists to give us five of the greatest moments of individual brilliance that they've seen uh, while they were working or while they were football fans. Uh, that actually makes you forget that you're there for work. And I'm delighted to say we have renowned football journalist Jonathan Wilson with us for the very first one of these. Jonathan, good morning to you. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? Um, this is great. You've you've put together a list which is perfectly in uh, our wheelhouse for those of us of a certain age. And I am delighted as a Villa fan to see that one of my favourite players is on your list here. Um, Mark Bosnich is number one here. Well, I've, I've done them in uh, in chronological order, to be fair. I hadn't, I hadn't actually ranked them one to five. Fair enough. And I should also say I was at that game as a, as a Sunderland fan. So it was, uh, yeah, Sunderland against Villa in the League Cup in 93-4. And Villa, of course, went on to win the League Cup that year. Um, Sunderland were uh, second flight side at the time. They'd, they'd beaten Leeds in the previous round to, you know, within a Premier League club. And I think that first half at Roker Park is as well as I've ever seen Sunderland play. And at halftime, they're 2 0 down because Bosnich just produced a string of ludicrous saves. Um, so there was, there was a, a Gordon Armstrong header from close range, he tipped over. Then the really great save was a, a looping header from Phil Gray. Uh, so Sunderland had Phil Gray and, and Don Goodman up front. Um, and I, I think. I think that was the first season they'd really sort of clicked as a partnership. And it, this looping header, and I, I was I was right in line with it behind it in the full end. And the the, the pace which Bosnich got across his goal and then flung himself up to just tip it over. I, I, I think that's the, the the best save I've ever seen in, in the flesh. Uh, absolutely astonishing. Uh, you have a technical ability of the foot movement to you know to work out what you need to do and then the athleticism to to spring up there. Uh, and suddenly end up losing the game 4-1. Uh, but Ron Atkinson, the Villa manager, said afterwards, "Yeah, there's only one team out there, and they end up getting beat." So yeah, uh, I, I think it can be difficult at times to pick out one individual performance, particularly now when the game is so team oriented. And I think yeah, that's why goalkeepers kind of fit this sort of pattern quite well. And Bosnich that day was just just absolutely unbeatable. It, it's funny because like he was actually great that whole season, and um, there's just a period of his career at Villa where. He's really sensational at stopping shots and actually has, has a period where he, st- he saves lots of penalties and wins penalty shootouts for Villa. Um, and I, I don't know, did it, was he in the top rank of goalkeepers at that time or was there some kinks in his game that prevented him from being thought of as like absolute top tier? Um, I, I think at that time, because he was still pretty young then, wasn't he? He could only have been early 20s. Um, and I think there's definitely a sense that that he was he was going to go on to great things. Obviously, he did go to Manchester United, um, where yeah, he's one of those those many goalkeepers who, who sort of struggled in the in the post Michael shadow. Um, so yeah, I, I think certainly that mid '90s period, you just said he was in the top sort of five or six in the Premier League or Premiership as it was then, um, with the potential to to, to 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 go on to far far greater. And the strange thing is, you know, I, I now I now do a bit of work with him on Australian TV, and I, I mentioned this game, and he sort of said nobody ever talks about this game. Nobody nobody saw it. You had to be a Sunderland fan or a Villa fan to watch it, because why would you be watching Sunderland v Villa? Uh, and I'd actually I'd looked up this game on on YouTube uh, a while ago, just as it was, well, in fact when I first started work, working with Mark Bosnitz, just to see if if he, if he had been as good as I remembered it, and I couldn't find it. So I was sort of thinking, was the th- th- does the footage even exist? But it is there now on YouTube as a ten minute. Uh, highlights package where you see, I mean, that's say from Armstrong, say from Gray. Then there's another one from Gray when when he he gets off his line very quickly. Gray so sort of tries to dink it over, and Bosnich just, just sort of thrusts up an arm and blocks it. And so yeah, he was absolutely as good as I remember him being. It's a pretty exciting Aston Villa team. It has uh, peak Tony Daly. It has Daly and Atkinson just like feeling himself as well. And um, it's kind of you know uh, big Ron's flamboyant football representative of him as a man and a character. Yeah, and well, that first goal, the first Villa goal, which uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, was pretty much the first time Villa had gotten the Sunderland half, is I think it's Kevin Richardson plays the ball through, and yeah, it's a classic counter attack, but you sort of see the difference in finishing between a really good side and a you know a first division side as was then, that uh, so Atkinson sort of running on a slight diagonal right to left, and I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with with Alec Chamberlain Sunderland keepers positioning. But he just sort of slices across it, and, and it's sort of this little sort of, it's sort of slightly the outside of his right foot, sort of a little jab, and and Chamberlain, you know, his, his whole weight goes the wrong way, and the ball pings in the bottom corner, 
And you just thought, yeah, oh God, that's that's proper finishing. That's that's what 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 we're lacking. So I mean, Atkinson that game was great. Uh, Ray Houghton came for bench and scored very quickly, and and, and obviously, yeah, getting towards the end of his career by then, but but helped knit things together in, in midfield. Um, I think Paul McGraw was still there at the back, wasn't he? In in, in that team. So yeah, that that it was a. It was a classic big run side, wasn't it? it yeah, was, totally. It was flamboyant, great to watch, but maybe lacking consistency. You, you, you need to win the biggest prizes. Paul McGrath and Steve Staunton, possibly? He's definitely no. on the books. I'm not sure he's playing that game. Maybe. Yeah, I, I can't remember that. I, I definitely, I'm, I'm pretty sure McGrath was playing against Phil Gray. It looks like Earl Barrett's at left back for whatever reason. Um, so, uh, you've also got Niall Quinn, number two on the list. Yeah, well, <laughs> partly appealing to the audience, but... Uh, no, I, mean, I, so I remember when Sunderland signed Niall Quinn um, and I think his debut was away against Nottingham Forest, which was the first away game of the Premier League season in 96-7. And he was brilliant that day and Sunderland won 4-1. I think they might even have been 4-0 up at half-time. Um, and then I, th- I think he played sort of eight league games and then got his knee injury. And I, I like a lot of Sunderland fans. I, mean, I, I the, the, the game I'm talking about is is when Sunderland beat Chelsea four one. I was actually working at that game. Um, it was one of my, my first games as a as a journalist. Um, but I, I was I was at that Forest game as a fan. Uh, but I, I remember sort of pretty quickly, a couple of months into that that first season um, of ninety six seven, becoming pretty disillusioned and thinking, oh, God, this guy's so slow. Why have we signed him? You know, he's he's clearly whatever he had at, at City, he's he's lost. And, and, you know, it took him a couple of years to, to get that properly diagnosed and sorted out. And then I was away at university, so I wasn't, I wasn't watching Sunderland Live that often. And started to hear from mates who were going that, actually, this guy's really good. And I couldn't quite sort of believe it. And I, rem- I remember sort of um, him, him, him scoring in an away defeat and sort of thinking, oh, God, that's going to keep him in the side another half dozen games. That's, that's not what we wanted. And then I went to, to see Sunderland away at QPR and he scored one and had two disallowed and was sensational. And I was sort of like, okay, that's that's the play he he yeah, he should have been with if he hadn't had the knee injury. And then uh the, yeah, those those two 97, 8, 98, 9, the first two seasons when he was together with with Kevin Phillips, they were yeah, brilliant together. Uh 98, 9, Phillips was actually injured for a lot of the season, which people forget. And, and Quinn and Michael Bridges and Danny Dicchio carried it. And then that first season up in the Premier League. Um, Sunderland got beat 4 0 at Stamford Bridge on the opening day. And then there's this game beginning of December uh, when Quinn absolutely destroys Marcel Desai. And, and that was the first game. I think Sunderland were, were third uh, off the back of that win. But this, that was the first game where I sort of thought, actually, maybe they, are, they, they genuinely are quite good. They're not just sort of riding this euphoric wave. And the, I mean, the other astonishing thing about, about that game was the middle of midfield, they had Eric Wah, a sort of unheard of French midfielder and Paul Thurwell, a local kid that they had, you know, um, Kevin Ball was out. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the whole of a normal midfield, uh, I think Stefan Schwartz must've been out as well. The whole, whole of that central midfield, uh, Alex Ray wasn't there was, was missing. And so, you know, very low expectations and someone took the lead, um, in, I think, I think the second minute and that first half, they absolutely destroyed Chelsea. Uh, and, and, and yeah, Desai, he, he played the next week, so he wasn't injured, but he was substituted at half time because he just couldn't handle Quinn. Why was he so good? What was it? Uh, goal scoring? Was it assisting? Was it just control of the ball? What was it? Well, he he, he scored twice, and I, th- I think he, he set up the other two. So the, he got he got a goal after two minutes, which is Eric Wah, a, a totally uncharacteristic sort of dribble through the middle and squared it, and Quinn pokes it in. But it, it was his movement. Um, the, the, I mean, yeah, I, th- I think it was Frank LeBeouf playing alongside Desai. So you sort of assume our oh, Quinn would 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 have a go at LeBeouf as being the, the the less physically imposing, but he didn't. He picked on Desai. Uh, so it was his movement dragging him out of position. It was, I think, the thing with Quinn that people who didn't watch him regularly perhaps don't don't quite appreciate is how good his chest control and his first touch was. So he, he didn't have much pace. That that's the one criticism. But you know, a player that size is never going to have much pace. Um, so I think it's the the third goal is a ball in so a diagonal ball in from the right that he takes down at the back post and it's a little side for volley and he scored a load of goals like that. It was a goal he scored in the league cup against Luton, this brilliant sort of lob volley having taken on his chest. And it could have been this this brilliant chest control 
control volley. And Ed Tahui makes a very good save and, and, and Phillips follows it in. Um, then then he gets the fourth, which is this uh, it's a corner, comes across the back post. It sort of missed everybody. And it's a very controlled volley into the far post. He doesn't just lash it. He he places this volley. And, and so, you know, it was a day when I guess he knew physically he was overmanning the, the, the guy he was up against. But also all of that technical ability was also right at the highest level. And there's a moment in the second half, which again, I haven't been able to find uh, footage of, but I, I'm pretty sure it happened. I mean, I, I found my notes on that day where I've written it down, that Sunderland got a throw on the right and Quinn and Phillips pass the ball to each other twice. And then I think it's Quinn has hits the volley. So the ball doesn't touch the ground from this throw in to Quinn hitting the volley and it hits the outside of the post. And if that had gone in, it would have been one of the greatest of all goals. And I think between them, Quinn and Phillips scored something like 149 goals over those three seasons, which yeah, if you strike bang to be banging in 50 between them each season on average is, is incredible. Does the fact that there is no video footage make this even more special, Jonathan, that you can be like, I was there and you'll never get to see it? <laughs> well, but part, part of me thinks, have I just made it up as my brain sort of somehow conjured that? I'm very glad I've still got the, the, the note I took at the time. And, and those were the days when you did take handwritten notes. You weren't just like, knocking it all down on your laptop. Um, but yes, it does. That, that, that In my head, it was this incredibly pure bit of movement. And I'm sure in reality, it was sort of slightly scruffier than that. Um, but but yeah, the, the and you sort of the, the third goal as well. You sort of think of a goal it could have been if Ed Dehu hadn't made that save. And I remember it being you know a real sort of scrambling diving save. You only just get fingertips to it, and obviously can't get enough power on the save to push it away. But you know that that could have been a, a really stunning, stunning goal. Which as I say, Quince Quince got a load of those volleys that I, th I think he probably doesn't quite get credit for. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I think probably because of his involvement in football afterwards, we've forgotten uh, just what a great footballer he was. Especially here because you know he's a central figure in Saipan and all that too. But anyway, John Kennedy is number three. This is um, this is unheralded for a lot of people. Barcelona nil, Celtic nil in the UEFA Cup fourth round, second leg in two thousand and four. What was so good about John Kennedy's performance? I think it's just it was so unexpected. So to, to set the scene, Celtic had obviously reached the UEFA Cup final in 2003, lost to Jesse Mourinho's Porto, and 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 following Celtic, or, you know, covering Celtic at that time was was a was a brilliant thing. You know, the 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 atmosphere at Parkhead was always great. That was you know, Martin O'Neill's team, uh, really exciting, attacking, dynamic football. Uh, yeah, Celtic away fans obviously were always very very noisy as well. And so I'd been at the first leg and there'd been, there'd been some problem with my accreditation. So I ended up uh, stuck behind the goal just, just with the fans, uh, which is never ideal when you're balancing the laptop on your knee. But um, uh, Celtic, uh, well, I can't remember when they get the goal, but anyway, the, 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 the second half, um, Thiago Motta is sent off. And as he goes off, I'm trying to work out how Barcelona, Barcelona are rearranging themselves. And... This is what I don't know, 10, 15 minutes in the second half. And I'm sort of going around, I'm thinking, there's only nine players there. I can't wait. And they're going, to, yeah, only nine. So I said to the bloke next to us, can, sorry, can you just count the Barcelona players and tell me how many there are? And he's, oh, there's only nine. wonder what's going on. So I, I, I rang a, a friend in the press box and said, how come Barcelona have only got nine men? And he went, oh, uh, Rab Douglas and uh, Saviola were sent off at half time for, for fighting in the tunnel. And because Celtic were... Yeah, defending the other end. We hadn't realised that um, uh, Marshall was was on for for Douglas and Celtic were also down to ten before the sending off. So it was nine v ten in the second half. Celtic win it one nil. Go to Barcelona. So they've they've got uh, Marshall in goal. He was a kid at the time. So I, I could have picked him. I didn't want to pick two keepers. And uh, they end up. I think Boba Balda was was suspended as well. So John Kennedy comes in as an eighteen year old. And the first 20 minutes of this game, Barcelona absolutely battered them. And Marshall makes a couple of really good saves. But you, you, you realise that about halfway through the first half that Barcelona is starting to lose hope. And one of the reasons for that is that Kennedy has totally taken Ronaldinho out of the game. And there's one tackle in particular, I remember, midway through the first half, where it looks like Ronaldinho has got past him and he just stretches out a leg and just clips the ball away. And... and then from then on, it was as if that tackle gave him confidence, and his performance from then was incredibly mature. And I remember watching that, and Celtic end up holding out pretty comfortably once they survive that, that initial storm, hold out pretty comfortably for a nil-nil to, to go through. 
and I remember thinking, right, Marshall and Kennedy, that these two kids are both brilliant and they're both going to go on to have great careers. And unfortunately, Kennedy got crocked by, by the Romanian Yolganea and, and was never really the same again. But he did have that one performance as an 18-year-old in the Camp Nou where he was absolutely out of this world and Mark Ronaldinho at the game. Did you know that there is a, a footballer currently playing for a Fluminense called John Kennedy? Uh, he was born in the early 2000s, so potentially named after that moment where uh, you know <laughs> the temporary Fluminense star was marked out of it. I mean, I, I, I think there's maybe a more famous John Kennedy he might be named after, but uh, <laughs> I, I'd love to believe that's true. <laughs> We'll, we'll do some digging and try and find out. Uh, next on our list is uh, Andre Ayew for Ghana against Tunisia in the Cup of Nations in 2012. Yeah, so um, I remember interviewing Ayu's father, Abedi Pele, uh, in, in Ghana when the Cup of Nations was there in 2008. And he was talking about his two kids and, and, and how good they were and how excited he was by them. And 2010 in Angola, that Ghana side, really good young side. I mean, Samuel Nkoum, uh, Agiman Badu, Kwadu Asamoa, Asamoa Jan, really good side, got to the final. Uh, lost to, to that very good Egypt team. And so there was sort of high, high expectations of them uh, in Equatorial and Gabon uh, in 2012. And they, they, they sort of had struggled slightly to get going in the group stage and they played Tunisia in the quarterfinal. And Tunisia, I mean, particularly back then, were, were always a, a very sort of very organised, very hard to play against. Um, there'd always be all kinds of chicanery going on. Um, they, they were a hard team to love, whereas that Ghana had you know a lot of a lot of life about them. And uh, Ghana take the lead early on, uh, a corner that's flicked on, and John Mensa, who actually went on to play for Sunderland, scores with a back post header. Uh, Tunisia then against the one to play equalised just for half time uh, through Saba Khalifa. And then Ghana absolutely battered them. And it's Ayu leading everything. Everything is going through him. And he's sort of playing as a second striker just behind Jan. And and well, this goes back to what I was saying you know, when I was talking about Bosnich, that I think in modern football, it's increasingly hard to pick out an individual. So you think of, say, David Beckham's performance against Greece in, in 2001, and that was a stunning individual performance. But it's actually a sign that everything is broken down, that one player is having to take everything on. And actually, I think that was detrimental to both Beckham and England in the longer term because Beckham kept trying to do that. And there's only certain very limited circumstances in which one player running everywhere works. I think the slight exception to that is if you're playing as a second striker and your midfield sits quite deep, you, you, you can leave your post a bit more and go hunting the ball. And now you just kept going back, picking up the ball, running with it, uh, kept getting fouled. He took an absolute battle in that game. Um, and Tunisia were getting deeper and deeper. They take it to extra time. You sort of, you're thinking, well, I've seen this before. Tunisia will nick something from a set play, or they'll, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll win it on penalties. That's that's, that's what Tunisia kept on doing. Um, and Ayu just keeps going, keeps going. Uh, Abdenur, the centre back, gets sent off for Tunisia uh, early in the second half of extra time. I, I think for a foul on Ayu. And then a couple of minutes after that, it's as if that that moment has totally discombobulated Tunisia. There's a very simple ball in from the right. Matluti, the, the Tunisia keeper, drops it. And the ball just drops to Ayu, I don't know, uh, four yards out, quite a narrow angle. And you can almost see the look of surprise and panic on his face that he's got this chance. Having he absolutely run himself into the ground for the previous hour, but he's got enough technical ability to just sort of poke that over the line. And uh, and Ghana win it, win it 2-1. But then he he probably, I think, had, was worn out by that. And you know he'd taken such a kicking. Um that in in the semi final against Zambia, he he, you know, he just he just wasn't there, and Zambia ended up winning it, and and going on, you know, one of the great Cups of Nations stories that of their them beating Cote d'Ivoire in the final in in Libreville, nineteen years after the air crash. But that performance from from Ayu in uh, in Franceville in the quarter final, it was just you know the the physical courage of it, the, the 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 kicking he took, and then just kept going back, absolutely remorseless and relentless. Perfect. The last one that we have is Romelu Lukaku. Yeah, he's a player who I have to say I don't really understand anymore. I, I, I thought I'd I thought I got him. I thought I kind of uh, I'd seen enough of him at into him with Belgium to sort of think, yeah, he he actually is a really great player. And what happened to Manchester United was Manchester United's fault. And then you saw him at Chelsea last season, and and I, I'm I'm back to being baffled again. But Lukaku, when he's on song, 
I think is an incredibly potent forward, incredible range of abilities. And this game against Brazil in the quarterfinal of the World Cup, which is in Kazan, I'd been based in Kazan for most of the tournament. I was very fortunate that I got a load of great games. So I saw Germany go out. Uh, I saw Poland go out. I saw Argentina go out. And then I saw Brazil go out this night. And uh, I'd, I'd seen Brazil. I'd, I'd, I'd been at the game in Samara when they beat Mexico in the last 16. You thought, oh, yeah, they're, 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 they're really good. They're the team that beat in this tournament. And the, the team lineups come in, and look at the Belgium team. Think, okay, Lukaku's playing through the middle. Oh, where's De Bruyne playing? It quite makes sense. Then they line up, and you realize, no, Lukaku's playing wide right, and De Bruyne is playing as a as a, as a false nine. You sort of think, well, how, how's that going to work? And you realize that, that Martinez had got it absolutely right, that it, it, it totally threw, threw Brazil. Lukaku's movement, pulling out to that right side, creating space was perfect. Uh, they Belgium really sort of. Uh, they, they focused on Brazilian left side, which you'd think would be a strength because they had Neymar and they had Coutinho down that side and, and Marcelo. Um, but actually, by, by attacking them down that side, they, they, they really, really exposed how, how weak Brazil were defensively on that side. And, and Lukaku was a huge part of that. Um, and his link up with, with De Bruyne uh, yeah, kept on coming inside and sort of an inside right role. And Brazil just didn't know how to pick him up. And I thought, for a player who's so physically imposing, who's so technically good, who's so good at scoring goals, to put in a sort of self-sacrificing performance like that was all about his movement. I, I thought that that suggests a player of, of profound tactical intelligence and somebody who's prepared to sacrifice himself absolutely to the to the greater good. Uh, and I assume he do that at Chelsea, and it, it, he, he didn't. <laughs> Um, you know, I thought Mason Mount could do what, what De Bruyne had done done that day, and and that didn't quite work out. But that 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 one day, his link up with De Bruyne, I thought was absolutely sensational. Oh, class! That's um, exactly what we were looking for this morning, Jonathan. Thanks a million for doing all that for us. Cheers. Cheers. No worries. Thank you. It's uh, Jonathan Wilson there with our inaugural episode of You Had to Be There, and um, yeah, we, uh, we, it's going to be you, hard beaten. You're going to get you to do your list, obviously. That's um, that's a very very strong list. We we're actually kind of, uh, it's like I mean. I would expect somebody who has uh, covered football for a long time, not Jonathan, but for somebody to say, you know, like Maradona or something like that, or Messi, did a few times, but that was... Uh, no, that's, uh, that's a sensational list. Yeah. The Nile Quinn stuff is class as well. Uh, so named after JFK, not, um, not Celtics, John Kennedy, we think. It's disappointing.